I'd like to tell you something about our block and what it's doing in the war. I call it our block because I live here and also because I'm the letter carrier. So I know my neighbors better than most. I know them and I like them. Now, Doc Crockett lives here. He's mighty busy these days. You know, most of the younger doctors are in the Army and the Navy. And besides that, he's giving our first aid classes and advising our families on nutrition problems. Now, that's old Mr. Nesbitt. He lives with his daughter and son-in-law, Nick Dunlap. Morning, Mr. Nesbitt. Hiya, Fred. Out for a walk again today? Oh, he's always saying something like that. Fine man. The children on the block all call him Uncle Henry, and they think the world of him. Now, that's Mr. Ryder. He's a lawyer and the air raid warden on our block. Takes a lot of magazines, big heavy ones, too. Oh, he's a great hand to read. Good morning, Fred. Good morning, Mr. Ryder. There you are. Thanks. Thanks very much. He helps us all with our income tax and all the other blanks we have to fill out for the government. And there's Mrs. Angelo getting the kids off to school. Mr. Tucker, the automobile dealer, lives next to the Angelos. He's a great help in keeping all the cars on our block in good shape for the duration. And there's Mrs. McAvoy sweeping her front porch. The McAvoys have got two boys, bright youngsters, too. Maury Abrams is getting up his flag. We all have flags on our block, but sometimes we forget to put them up. Oh, I know we shouldn't forget, but we're all pretty busy nowadays. You know how it is. And there's Anatole Giraud. He's a Frenchman, so I say, bonjour. Good morning, Fred. Bonjour, Monsieur. Fred, you are getting better. You speak almost like a native. He's got two sons in the Navy and a brother fighting somewhere with the Free French. And Stanley Kubusinski lives across the street. He's got a fine vegetable garden in his backyard. Now, there's the Humphrey home. Newt's an engineer. And is he busy these days? Now, there's Mrs. Beebe. She's a widow, and those are her two daughters, Lucille and Norma. The Eriksons live here. That's Sven with the two lunch boxes. They're Swedes, and they got a rumor, Emil Swartz. There's Emil now, backing out the car. Emil comes from a German family. Ericsson's a Swede, Giroux's a Frenchman, and the BB girls are of English descent. Put them all together, and they spell America. Anyway, that's how we think of it in our block. You've seen just a few of our neighbors. Now, down the street live the Loomises, the Joneses, the Lockwoods, the O'Days, the Browns, the Moody's, and a lot more, including the Copelands. That's me, Fred Copeland, letter carrier. Everybody knows me. They say the postman always rings twice. But I never have to ring more than once, for the folks are always on the lookout for mail these days. Here's a letter for you. Thanks. They tell me about the good news that I bring them and, and the bad news when it comes. Evenings, they like to sit around and talk about their work, because they're mighty proud of what they're doing in this war. For instance, you take Stan Kubasinski, who works on the second shift at the tank plant. Stan's worried about his folks in Poland. He don't hear a word from them. Oh, he never says much about it, but I guess he does a lot of thinking. Stan used to live on the outskirts because he always liked to work in the earth. Is that right, Stan? That's right, Fred. We're the place quite a way out, next to one of the nicest farms you could find around here. Then. One day in the summer of 1940, we saw a surveyor on the property. A couple weeks later, the steam shovels went to work. And through the fall and winter on that farm was growing a great tank arsenal. land was finished, and that part was hidden by a locomotive. We went to work on the first of our medium tanks. 
Even then, nearly a year before Pearl Harbor, we knew that time was precious, so we didn't waste any getting started. Day after day, we got new machines, hundreds of them, along with thousands of gauges and fixtures and tools, each one going into the place that had been planned for it. <laughs> all worked up when the day came for us to turn over to the army the first M3 medium tanks. After we'd made many hundreds of M3s, the army wanted us to build a new tank. So we went right to work, and after months of planning and preparation, we accomplished what we'd never done in automobile days. We changed models without stopping our production lines. We were all pretty excited out of the arsenal the day the last General Lee came off. And there, right behind it, was the brand new M4, the powerful General Sherman. What's more, the government wanted them in much larger quantities than before. So our tank plant was enlarged. Complete departments were moved into other company plants. And we also added new assembly lines. So now they are coming out faster and faster. And let me tell you, they are beauties too. We had another thrill, a great thrill, when one day we looked up and there was the Commander-in-Chief himself with our big force. So you fellows got started months before we got into the war, huh? That's right. And it's a good thing we did, too. We were building tanks long before the Japs attacked us. And they've been rolling off the lines ever since. When we boys go to the movies and see newsreels of American tanks in action in Africa and Russia and over there in those Pacific Islands, pushing through, winning battles, bringing the day of victory that much nearer, well, it makes a man feel proud of the work he's doing. I should think it would. Of course, I don't work on the tank engines. If you want to know about them, ask Maury Abrams. Yeah, I will. So I dropped in on the Abrams house to see Maury. Does Miss go on next? Anybody home? Hello, Fred. Come right Hello, in. Hello, Mr. Copeland. Hello, Arthur. Gee, Dad, I've got to help Uncle Henry. Then run along. Goodbye, Mr. Copeland. Bye. Have a cigar, Fred? Sure, thanks. We had a big day at the plant since the last time I saw you. Yeah, what happened? It was some time ago, but I just forgot to tell you about it. In the first place, you know we build the engines that go into army tanks. What happened was, we were asked to design a tank engine out at our place that could be built on our own machinery. That's just what we did. And is it a wow? But we're not stopping there. Right now, the engineering department is working on a new engine that'll be even better. But what about that big day you spoke of, Maury? Well, the boys of the tank arsenal got there ahead of us. They were mighty proud out there when they were awarded the Army-Navy E-Flag, the first to be given a tank plant in the country. Then came our turn when we got the E-Flag, too. The citation read, 
for achievement in the production of war materials. Since then, other plants of the corporation have won it also for making cannons and other things. Still, it's different when it flies over the place where you work. They say it means excellence, but I figured out something else it might stand for. What do you think the E stands for, Maury? Understand, friend. This is just my own idea. And it may sound kind of silly to you, but some of the boys at the plant think it's pretty good. Well, anyway, here it is. E means that in this emergency, every hour of every day, each man will give earnestly and efficiently everything he's got to these essential engines so our expeditionary forces can engage the enemy, encircle, and eventually exterminate him and establish everlasting equality of opportunity. Say, that's well. My boy, you helped me a little bit with it. Good for him. You know, Murray, if the Army and Navy heard it, I'll bet they'd say that's just what they want that E of theirs to stand for. Say, can I take that and make some copies of it? I want to show it to the boys down at the post office. Why, sure, Fred. I'll see that you get it back. <clears throat> now, there's Nick Dunlap. He just came home from work. I don't see his father-in-law. I want you to meet him. He's a character. Hello, Nick. Where's Uncle Henry? Oh, hello there. He's out with the kids. Come on, sit down. I'll be back in a little while. How are things going out where you work? Couldn't be better. But that's what you'd expect from an outfit like ours. You see, building for war was nothing new to us. Our company was founded during the First World War. Why, we still got a car out there that was used by General Pershing 25 years ago. So we knew what it was all about. That's why we were one of the first to supply our new streamlined army with transportation. We got a head start on a lot of the boys because we'd been through all this in the other war. Why, even by the summer of 1941, months before Pearl Harbor, we'd made and delivered more than 75,000 specially designed army trucks. It's a mighty important job you fellows are doing. You bet it is. Why, do you realize that our trucks were the first to see service in Africa and the first to go across the new highway to Alaska? You know, you can't expect soldiers to fight unless you can get them to where it's going on. We'll move them up to the front and we know what they'll do after they get there. You bet we know. Every man jack up. Soldiers, sailor, and marine. Now let's drop in on another neighbor, Dan McAvoy. You'll most likely find him down in the basement working on some new gadget. Hiya, Dan. Hello, Fred. Come on down. What's that, uh, another military secret? Not quite yet, but it may be some of these days. Did they ever use that other idea of yours? They certainly did. I like to fool around down here, just like a lot of other fellas do in their basements. Try to figure out ways to save time and eliminate waste motion. So as to get the work out quicker. You know, airplane wing assembly is rather complicated. It takes a lot of hard study. But we do know that the sooner we get those babies up in the air, the sooner this thing is going to be over. Keep them flying, eh, Dan? Fill the skies with them, said I. Let the skies be filled with them. Smash the titles that try to take away our rights and liberties. Smash them! <laughs> they the says preserve me enough the awkward loot. Good old Dan. He certainly gets himself worked up. But perhaps that's a good idea nowadays. We'll look in on Lucille and Norma Beebe. Two of the nicest girls in our block. Well, what can I do to help? Well, the potatoes are on. Suppose you whip up some biscuits while I get out of these things and take a shower. Hot biscuits and honey. Mm -hmm. Why, it's Mr. Copeland. Well, come right in. What do you suppose I saw today? Never could guess. Well, tell us. A man welder. <laughs> <laughs> Will you excuse me? I'll be right back. Go right ahead, Lucille. How's the job going, Norma? Oh, just fine. Here, have a cookie. Baked to myself. Thanks. You know, you hear a lot of talk nowadays about women working in factories. But for years, women have been helping to build automobiles. So making airplanes was just a natural changeover when the war came. We're proud of the housekeeping our plant, where everything is so clean and orderly. And that's just the way it should be, as a setting for those wonderful ships. 
Why, it's positively thrilling the way our fuselage sections are coming off. Unless you've actually done it yourself, you can't appreciate the feeling you have when you help to create one of those beautiful machines and you realize that the life of one of our boys may depend on what you do. You modern girls are wonderful. Not a bit more than our mothers and grandmothers. They worked just as hard, only they had different jobs. By the way, how is your mother? She's fine. And about time she should be home, too. She works three days a week at the Red Cross. What a family. What a busy, useful family. In other words, what an American family. But then there are a lot of them in our block and all over the country. Take Pete Angelo, for example. There he is with his son, Nino. Hiya, Pete. Oh, it's Fred Copeland. Just one more and the game is finished. Got lots of time. Ah, these kids gotta be doing something all the time. We should all be doing something. That's right. You should see Fred Copeland, how busy we are at our plant. Well, I guess you heard it's one of the largest in all the world. Why, just one of those buildings covers as much as 50 city blocks. It takes 23 restaurants to feed our people. 23 restaurants. And that engine, so big, so powerful. It's no wonder the government wants so many of them. Our factories are going like a house of fire now, aren't they? Yes, they are. But listen, Fred Copeland, we should be doing more and more and still more until the people of all the world are free again. Yes, sir. Goodbye. And that's the way it goes up and down our block. Let's see how Anatolia Roll's getting along. About this trial compass, I am permitted not to tell you everything. But however, it is very interesting the way it is tested. We have a way to, uh, to make believe, to simulate all the motions of a ship at sea. And so we test our compasses that when they leave us, they are perfect. They are most intricate machines and as delicate as the finest watch. And so important. You see, when a ship is protected against magnetic mines, then the old magnetic compass, it was useless. So this electric compass, for that's what it is, became one of our most vital war necessities. And we turned them out faster and in larger quantities than anyone has ever done before. So I keep these tools clean and bright for such an instrument as the gyro compass with its so beautiful delicacy. Sven Eriksson and Emil Swartz are great pals. We'll probably find them together. You can go in, but quietly, please. I guess that will do it. Fine move. Brilliant move. I withdraw. So we bought one a game today, huh? Why, hello, Fred. You come in so quiet, we didn't even hear you. How's everything? Just fine. Emil and I, we play chess to forget about the war for a little while. But all day long, I'm at the plant, helping to make the Bufos anti-aircraft cannon. A very intricate gun, this Bufos, with thousands of parts. We make the big barrels, the heavy breech rings, and the recoil mechanisms. In fact, we make everything. And then we assemble them, too. The Army and Navy say they are one of Uncle Sam's best defenses against dive bombers and torpedo planes. So we are putting them out as fast as we can, you betcha. And while Sven makes the cannon, we and our plant are turning out millions of rounds of ammunition. They range in size from bullets for tummy guns to explosive shells for anti-aircraft fire. Our management took one of our automobile assembly plants and turned it into an ordnance plant. We do everything from making shell casings to loading and test firing. In other plants, we make armor-piercing ammunition and 20 millimeter explosive shells. If you could hear some of those big boys let go, you would say we're doing a buy-up job. That's right, boys. Keep them firing. What's that noise? Somebody fooling around your car? Oh, it's only our friend Lloyd Tucker. He wants to make sure the car is all right. Why, of course it's Lloyd. 
I didn't recognize him. How goes it? Hello, friend. All right. I drop around now and then on my neighbors just to be sure they're taking care of their cars. You automobile dealers are sure doing your share. There ain't no doubt about that. Of course, we automobile men are helping, too. For example, our corporation has set up an organization to provide essential parts for its cars and trucks. There are more than seven million cars and trucks built by our corporation in use today. And we feel a definite responsibility to help our owners wherever they are and at whatever time. So we have central depots in main distribution centers in addition to the dealers serving every section of the country. It's through these repair shops operating on a carefully worked out system that we try to supply any spare part needed to keep our portion of the nation's transportation units in good running order. That's a fine thing. I don't know what the men in our block would do if they didn't share rides with their neighbors. Yeah, we gotta keep them running or we'd swamp our streetcars and buses. And when you have a good car to start with, it doesn't take much time and money to maintain it in the best condition. You've certainly got to do that today. You bet you do. And then you realize that the manufacturer has built more mileage and more dependability into his product than you had any idea of. And now, all that expert knowledge is being put to work to help win the war. Everybody's putting his heart into his work these days. If you don't think so, ask Newt Humphrey what his outfit's doing. He won't tell you much, but ask him anyway. You may learn something. Sorry, Fred, but Mom's the worried on the things we're working on now. You can understand that. Of course, this isn't the first time we engineers have had to keep secrets about what we were developing in our research laboratories. Mm, is that so? You bet. And don't forget that we fellows pioneered the all-steel automobile body. Hydraulic brakes, floating power, high-compression engines, and fluid drive. Those and many other devices for greater safety, economy, and comfort were for an army, the great army of American motorists. Now we're putting all our engineering talent and ingenuity to work for another army and for the Navy. Yes, we're keeping secrets again, and mighty important ones, too. We've got a lot of things on the fire, Fred, but that we think are going to be tremendous. Yes, sir? All our facilities for research and manufacturing are devoted exclusively to the war effort. We're going to have bigger guns and shells, more accurate sights, more powerful engines, faster planes and greater tanks and trucks. All these and more lie in the future somewhere this side of victory. And if you don't think they're needed, here comes a young fellow who'll tell you differently. Who's that? Jimmy. Jimmy? Is he back in this country? He's home on leave. Yes, come in last night. Oh, come on in, son. Well, Jimmy, my boy, I'm glad to see you. How are you? Well, I'm fine, Mr. Copeland. You look just about the same. Oh, I'll go on forever. But never mind us. What about yourself? Oh, it's, it's great to be home. But I'm anxious to get back over there again. I'm going, too, as soon as this bum leg heals up. You know, we've really started to move. There's no doubt about it. Everybody says so. It may take a long time yet, but anyhow, we've started, and that's the important thing. You know, we don't hear any squawks about our equipment, either. Those planes and tanks and guns, they're all working together. But keep them coming. We need more of everything and still more. You folks at home have to realize it. You're soldiers, too, just as much as we are except that you have a different job to do. Don't forget those guys we're fighting are plenty tough. But we can be a whole lot tougher if we all pull together. I understand, I, I'm not complaining. And that goes for the boys up north where it's plenty cold. The boys in the desert where it's plenty hot. The boys that have to dig their beds in the jungle swamp. The boys in the air and the boys on the sea. You just do your part and you'll see. We'll do ours. Praise the Lord, Jimmy, those on our block are doing their part. Jack Loomis is putting in plenty of time and energy making aluminum forgings for airplanes. Four men of our block are in departments producing critical machine tools, anti-aircraft gun and bomber parts made of powdered iron, steel, and other metals. Fred Brown's heart is all wrapped up in the field kitchens he's building. If he has his way, no fighting man will ever go hungry. Art Lockwood works on firefighting equipment for defense against air raids. Mike Jones assembles the big sirens for air raid protection. 
Joe Moody's an expert welder on pontoons for the Navy. And Hal Fisher is on those huge marine tractors to push landing barges, firefighting equipment, and other shallow water boats. While Shorty Baroni puts the finishing touches on air conditioning equipment for Army and Navy hospitals. Tony Sargent hits the ball on heating and cooling apparatus for maintaining proper temperature and moisture control in factories and laboratories. And Tom Pearson puts in 48 hard working hours each week on complex, sturdy landing gears for our fighter planes. Yeah, the folks in our block are doing their part. And with it comes the satisfaction of work well done. For some of us, it's the end of another day. While other men and women are just starting off to work. For the wheels of industry must keep turning night and day until this war is won and peace comes again to this troubled world. As I told you in the beginning, there's nothing extraordinary about our block. We're just average American citizens and the high hopes, the dauntless courage and the grit to see it through. Why that phrase the Lord is just average American too. Nothing to talk about. Say, looks like you got a good haul today. Oh, it's the same every day. Those kids are irresistible, and they work like Trojans. There aren't any shirkers or complainers in our block, Dad. Not on our block, nor any block in America, I hope. We're all in this now, fighting on the battlefront and on the home front in defense of our freedoms. The freedom to worship God in our own way, according to our own conscience. The freedom of the press. The freedom of speech the freedom to make a home for our loved ones and ourselves, to work in the earth and enjoy the fruits of our labor, to work in the factories of industry where American initiative accomplishes so much, whether in peace or in war. It is this spirit of American business enterprise that has built a small town and has erected the great cities among the many wonders of the new world. You hear people say we are too slow getting into this fight for freedom. But they forget that all these years we've been learning the arts of peace. And we've learned them so well that no other people on earth lived so free and so bountiful a life and erected such imposing monuments to freedom. And the American way of living well, I went to work around 30 years ago at the same plant where you're working now. That's right, Dad. Why, for more than a quarter of a century, we built cars and trucks. We didn't think of it just like this. As a matter of fact, we were building them for freedom. For freedom to travel about our glorious country, to carry us to and from our work, to bear clergymen and doctors and nurses on errands of mercy, to transport food and goods but at the same time, we were accomplishing a greater end. Don't let them tell you we weren't prepared for this war. Why, we had on tap an unmatched score of mechanical brains and engineering genius that we've been building up for 40 years. When it comes to working with steel, iron, and other metals, with glass, rubber, and plastics, I'd have you know that we in the automobile industry know how and we found out how by working together, by learning together, and by building together. We furnished the tools of war, and we placed them in the hands of the bravest fighting men in the world. Further than that, whether we are fighting around the world with our army and navy and marines, or whether we are enlisted in the army of industry, our faith is firm and our will is strong with confidence in our armed forces and the unbounded determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph. 
so help us God.